Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Mission First, the podcast to learn from successful entrepreneurs who are changing the world for the better. My name is Gilles Toussaint, and every second week, I interview one successful entrepreneur with a company mission related to the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. There are a lot of resources out there to help you kick off your company, but not a lot to help you manage the turmoil of the first two to three years. That's why my guests are usually entrepreneurs who have recently gone through these difficult first years successfully. Together, during more than one hour, we discuss their challenges and what they've learned on the way. We go into detail with a specific focus on company culture, leadership, funding, business strategy, growth strategy, and product development. That way, you learn hands-on tips on how to build a better future and a successful company too. Today, my guest is Pierre-Yves Paslier, co-founder and co-CEO of Notpla, a company that makes packaging disappear. They have created a cutting-edge packaging material directly made from the ocean, from seaweed. It's biodegradable in four to six weeks, and it can actually be eaten. This episode is perfect for you if you want to learn how to go from an idea to a cutting-edge sustainable product through several years of R&D. Pierre created his company in 2014, and it started as a student project. They have now more than 25 employees, they have industrialized two products, and a third one is on its way. We talked with Pierre about how he used an innovative funding method, equity crowdfunding, to get funding when classic investors didn't want to fund the next stage of the company. That way, they got more than £850,000 from 900 private investors. You will also hear how to take advantage of social media and PR to raise awareness on your brand and your product. Pierre and his team managed to create several viral campaigns without working with any external agency and without spending a single penny on PR or social media. They grew everything organically, with some videos reaching more than 90 million views. In fact, I'm pretty sure you've seen some of them explaining how they trap water inside these little transparent bubbles of seaweed packaging who can be eaten directly during events like marathons or festivals. We also talked about their IP strategy, how they decided to patent certain things and keep others as a secret recipe without patent. Pierre shared seven do's and don'ts about his experience of entrepreneur and specifically about the topic on how to bring a disruptive technology on the market. Notpla won, among others, the World Technology Award in the Environmental Category and the Climate Kick UK Venture Competition. They are really revolutionizing single-use packaging in the food industry, so fasten your seatbelt and let's start this episode together. Pierre, thank you very much for being here today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. But uh, Let's start before Notpla. Which person has... Uh, inspired you to become an entrepreneur? Well, I think that's the, a bit the funny thing about like, this, uh, this journey with Notpla is that uh, neither my co-founder nor myself really aspired to start a company or become entrepreneurs. I think that we did it out of like circumstances. Uh, we created products. Um, so we came to this as like uh, designers who were excited about bringing a uh, a product um, that would solve a problem for, for people. And we kind of realized that if we weren't doing it ourselves, nobody would develop that, nobody would push it. So our only choice was to actually like do it ourselves. And, and that meant becoming entrepreneurs and, and starting this company. Okay. And so you are the founder of Notpla. Can you tell us a bit what Notpla's mission is? I actually, actually read that it's to make black plastic packaging disappear. So can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, so it's to make packaging disappear. And uh, definitely like we, we like this, this, uh, this mission as both being like literally making your piece of packaging for whatever uh, product you're buying disappear quickly from the environment. But we think as well that like, packaging as a whole should be something that like disappears uh, compared to the, the huge presence it has in the world right now. 
Um, and our solution is not the only one to tackle this problem. Uh, we think it's going to be a conjunction of, of, of solutions. But overall, if we could make packaging simply disappear, we would solve a lot of like uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain us a bit how you accomplish that mission right now? I, I know you have developed several types of products, so can you can you present them a bit? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so when we we started this uh, uh, back in 2014, we uh, we started with Oho, which is uh, our first product. It's a little bubble that uh, can contain liquids like water, beverages. It's transparent. It's about the size of like a, a cherry tomato, and the the envelope, the, the the membrane is made from seaweed. That makes it. First of all, naturally biodegradable, uh, completely renewable material, but also edible. And the fact that you could eat your packaging was uh, definitely something that felt very different from the types of packaging we are uh, seeing in our daily life uh, uh, everywhere. So uh, we were really intrigued by this idea that like, if something is, is edible, it's definitely not going to create a long lasting waste in the environment because if, if I can eat it, nature can eat it for sure. Um, so I think we thought that was quite interesting. Um, and, and from there, uh, we, uh, like we started this product actually, um, during our, our studies at a master's called uh, innovation design engineering at the Royal college of art and Imperial college. And, uh, my co-founder and we're working on this, like, As a student project, it wasn't meant to, to become a startup, as I said, uh, but like the outcome of this was videos and photos that actually we posted online and that went viral. Um, and so uh, over the summer, uh, in between the two years of the masters, uh, we just couldn't believe that like there were millions and millions of like views on YouTube and articles written about it. So it really felt like people were really excited about this, uh, like slightly weird packaging concept that we had come up with. And I think that really uh, like made us realize that, first of all, there were not too many alternatives on, on the market and that, uh, if, yeah, if we weren't going to push that ourselves, it would be a long, long time before a big company like Tetra Pak or Amcor or Storenzo decides to invest in developing something like this. We can't leave it in the hands of the big companies to, to provide the solutions, especially because they have a vested interest in the current solutions. So we were like, okay, if we, if, if people really want it, and if, uh, we think that no one else is going to like make it happen, uh, we should, we should jump in. Um, so, so we developed this, uh, this product, um, realizing that it was mainly going to be, uh, a good solution for instant consumption. So that's really where we focus our attention with this product. Um, it is a bit like a fruit um, and it really biodegrades like a fruit. So it's naturally biodegradable. It, it literally can break down faster than the peel of a fruit in a compost bin in your garden. Or I have one in my kitchen, like a wormery, and it, it's, it's the worm's favorite food, if that makes sense. So it's really, really easy for nature to break it down wherever it ends up which is a big difference compared to a lot of uh, bioplastics that claim to be biodegradable, but in reality, they don't. Uh, like the main one being PLA, which is made from cornstarch initially, but it's a synthetic polymer that is made from transforming cornstarch into this plastic. Um, and it actually never breaks down in nature. You need to put it in a special industrial compost. So that was something that we wanted to kind of like really differentiate ourselves uh, a lot with. Um, so, so we, we started, you know, like developing these like little fruits, like products filled with liquids for different applications, realizing that there was actually a really good match for things like marathons, um, uh, and, uh, festivals. Um, and a bit later on, we also realized that it could work quite well with sauces for takeaway, like ketchup and mayo sachets and things like this. So Oho, this product is really focused on this kind of, uh, applications. And then, um, like, as we continue to develop, uh, the, the company, we actually, uh, like realized that there was other ways we could act, we could use our, uh, our seaweed, uh, based technology, uh, to, to, to challenge some other use of plastic. And one of them is 
the thin layer of plastic that is applied onto cardboard boxes for food application. So this is our second product. Uh, it's uh, the nut plaque coating, which is used for, for, for takeaway uh, hot food. And in this case, it provides resistance to uh, grease and to water for the cardboard not to go soggy. Because if you've ever done like papier mache when you were a kid, cardboard in contact with water immediately goes soggy. So currently the industry is either using a thin layer of plastic or they are putting a lot of quite nasty additives onto the cardboard to make it super resistant to water. But both of these things are actually pretty bad when they end up in the environment or even when you eat out of them your hot food. So that's why we wanted to develop a, a cardboard box that would be pure cellulose without any kind of like uh, synthetic additives and a coating made from seaweed. And and I think from there, we also kind of like realized that there was a possibility of, of, of creating a flexible film um, that would be a good packaging for lots of dry products that are currently wrapped in like plastic sachets. Um, and one of the property that was key in this case was uh, heat sealability because this is how the like the technology works for plastic. You you heat uh, with jaws the like the the seal and that closes the the bags. And so um, we had to find ways to make the the seaweed material react in a similar way than plastic to heat, which, we, which we've started to, to, to get some like pretty good uh, like results uh, with right now. And so we're going to develop this as like rolls of material that can be uh, used with the same uh, machines that are used for plastic uh, to form like little bags for anything from like screws and nuts from your IKEA furniture to uh, waterless cosmetics or pasta or rice. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the third product. Um, we, uh, like, we have plenty of things uh, in the pipeline uh, somewhere from like very early stage concept to a little bit more developed. Um, and we think that there's a, there's a huge opportunity for seaweed to be used in lots of applications. But right now we've committed to make those three rich markets before we really push the other ones. So, oh, not super easy to say sometimes, but like it's, fun, it's a <laughs> funny name. So the, these edible uh, capsules, like bubbles uh, for yeah. liquids, the cardboard liners, and the films for uh, the film for solids. Yeah, uh, these are the three products, and the t two of them are already industrialized and being sold and used, and the third one is in develop or in the process of being in industrialized. Yeah, so I mean, it's uh, it's always a spectrum, but definitely OHO being the first one we developed, we uh, we we actually have now like uh, reach a, a relatively stable uh, manufacturing technology, and and we've like produced at scale uh, for for large uh, like, like large events. Um, we did the London Marathon uh, last year, which was really exciting to see an entire water station completely plastic free. Um, Obviously, right now there's not too many marathons, but uh, it's really exciting to to have proven that. And when when things uh, kickstart again, we're we're ready to jump in. Um, we've been doing large trials uh, in London uh, with the the sauce sachets with Just Eat and Unilever uh, for like ketchup and mayo with like tens of restaurants. So that's also really exciting to see uh, that this works at that scale. Now, um, like the, the scale up from there um, is quite specific for OHO because one of the things we realized is that um, we like seaweed, especially seaweed in contact with a liquid, is always going to have a relatively short shelf life because that's like one of the main ways for nature to start biodegrading something is having contact with like a decent amount of moisture or water to have bacteria and most of the time to have oxygen. And you can't kind of like remove bacteria or oxygen uh, from, from like the, from the environment. So um, the, the main thing that like drives the biodegradability of, of our product is really uh, their contact with water. Um, and in the case of the films and the coatings, as long as the product is kept dry, it actually have, has a relatively long shelf life. But in the case of OHO, which 
like is the case where it contains liquid, it's definitely uh, like the process can start easier. So it's very similar to a fruit. Uh, a fruit, you can't keep it on the shelf for three years. Uh, it's just going to uh, start rotting and that's nature's mechanism to recycle uh, the, the nutrients in the carbon. So in the case of OHO, uh, we had this kind of like problem that we couldn't really fit the traditional supply chain uh, that, is, that has been built around plastic. So we had to find another way to bring our products if we wanted to use those materials that are super biodegradable. Um, so in our case, uh, we, we, we decided to combine the, the really kind of like natural material with local manufacturing, um, which allows for production really close to the point of consumption. Um, and that means that there is much less transportation. Things are uh, like made or like fresh directly for like a specific uh, geographical area that is quite small. Um, and, and that hub model um, really works well for, for food, actually, like and for beverages all over. You look at Starbucks, they don't make like your coffee in another country and ship it to you and it's like while it's still uh, like hot. They they have lots of like coffee houses everywhere to like make things directly for you. So in our case, uh, it's not at the scale of a Starbucks, but it's basically hubs for cities. Um, and and to to do that, we had to make a machine that would be relatively small. Um, we, we didn't want to have like machines that are the size of like a plastic factory that produce for an entire continent. Uh, it didn't make sense. So um, so we've developed a, a technology and we, we've, we've created those machines that are about the size of like a large fridge that can produce maybe not as big like quantities as like a factory, but you can have lots of them side by side. Um, and that way we have something that is a lot more modular and that enables the like the shorter shelf life of our material, so that it can be produced just a few weeks before it's consumed uh, in a local restaurant or a local event. And so a few weeks before. Herbs. So like for example, yes. for the so, for the so the London Marathon uh, for for a marathon in general, how long does it take you to to produce a certain amount of quantities for the marathon? So depending on how machines we have, it's uh, like it can be like. Right now, our shelf life depends quite often on what we contain. Uh, like some things have a very short shelf life, like uh, cold pressed juice. We've done that with PepsiCo for their Tropicana brand at Roland Garros, and they literally had like a, a five day shelf life or something like this. So we had to produce right before uh, Roland Garros. But for water, we probably have like three, four weeks of, uh, of, of shelf life. Uh, so that gives us that time to, to produce, which is actually plenty of time. If you're going to produce for something that is not on the other side of the world, uh, you can actually produce and deliver it uh, quite locally. And, and, and the great thing about this is that it also reduces uh, transport quite a lot. And transport is about a third of the impact of like bottled water. So, so if we tackle like the plastic with the, with the like change of material, and the carbon with the transport, plus the fact that seaweed is actually very good in terms of carbon. Uh, All together, we have uh, something that creates no plastic at the end of life. And we've done a life cycle analysis for, for ketchup sachets and compared to a Heinz ketchup sachet, we reduced by 70% the, the CO2 uh, footprint. Um, so that's really exciting to tackle both climate change and uh, plastic pollution. Yeah, that's really exciting to hear. Uh, let's talk a, a minute about the some some numbers to, to understand where you are at right now. So, can you confirm me how many like full time employees do you have right now? Um, so uh, we have just over twenty five employees um, right now. And in terms of um, financing, how how much have you raised so far? Yeah. So all in all, I think we've raised uh, over five million pounds. Um, we we raised uh, like a first round uh, of equity crowdfunding uh, in 2017, which was 850,000 uh, pounds. Um, and then after that, we uh, we got a, a convertible loan from Sky Ocean Ventures uh, the following year. And back in December, we raised uh, like a new round of financing with some uh, impact uh, funds. Of four million pounds. Okay, uh, and in terms of clients right now, can you like 
how how many clients are we talking about right now so it's a range because like we um we have our goal is to help companies stop using plastic so um obviously we think that there is a great deal of impact that can be done through the large fmcg uh groups but equally they are pretty slow to move and so uh, if in our uh like in our country there is uh, restaurants or shops or uh, events organizers who can have an impact directly we also want to work with these guys because they are definitely uh like uh much easier to uh to engage with and to get things started so we really have a blend of like small and large partners i think the ones that end up kind of like being talked about all the time is more like the Unilever and Just Eat and Lucozade for the festivals uh, and PepsiCo and so on. But uh, b but like to to reach scale with those, uh, it takes months and months of like pushing. Whereas um, literally we are uh, we're selling uh, some of our packaging to our uh, neighbor on the on the yard where we are based, and they are like reducing their plastic use uh, at a much smaller scale, but it's, it's very meaningful for us to be able to provide that, uh, uh, at that scale as well. And, and also the thing is that, um, this is a new technology. Um, so although, uh, we would love to roll this out with like a big partner at a massive scale, it's going to take a couple of years to reach scale for even matching one of their product lines. So at the moment, when you look at our manufacturing, uh, like capacity, it's definitely more attuned to working with smaller partners than to kind of like match the, the typical requirements of a large uh, partner. Obviously, there's like there's things you can do at, at the smaller scale that are still very meaningful to get the conversations going. But, um, but yeah, if you want to start serving a, a Unilever, uh, you need to have like uh, hundreds of millions of units per, per month. And we're very far from being able to produce that. And in terms of business plan, uh, like, of course, you can have a lot of like, it can be very meaningful to help the small brands. But lots of companies sometimes say, okay, you know, you need to aim big so that you have a, like, a, it, can, it can be profitable. Um, are you already like profitable right now? Not at all. I think that like, right now we are very uh, R&D uh, focused. There is, there is so much development in this area seaweed is very understudied so we are um, heavily investing in, in r&d so it means that uh, like for now uh, the small manufacturing capacity that we have doesn't kind of like outweigh the like the expenditure on, on r&d that being said i think that like on the unit economics we are definitely uh, like uh, making things look very kind of like exciting um, but this is a uh, like this is typically a, like a high volume, low margin market. So uh, like we're very kind of like aligned with our investors that for now, the goal is not to kind of like uh, make profit on the back of like the, the, the few kind of like uh, tens of thousands of units we can produce right now, but it's much more to kind of like prove that everything is very uh, like is, is very well understood and replicable replicatable in other places and 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 kind of like see what are what's going to be the path to to scale up the, the fastest one so okay so because you're talking about financing this is a very 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 interesting part so but before jumping onto that i'd like to talk about the very very beginning uh when you said you know you had this viral videos uh like uh for for, for the the boho at the time can you explain us just shortly when that happened? At which date you 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 were in the development of the product and or the company? Did you have actually a company when when that viral video like uh, went out, or did like did you have actually a product that was just you know in the lab when you did it? So how did that happen? Uh, what are the few steps before that to have the you know the two of you uh, the two co-founders? meet and in order to be able to design that first product and to get that like uh, that first viral video yeah um yeah we we had neither a company or a lab or anything um but um so 
I met Rodrigo uh, in this master's called Innovation Design Engineering. Um, it's a master's that is quite interesting uh, because it's mainly for uh, returning professionals. So people who have worked for a few years uh, in their industry. Um, Rodrigo's background is in architecture and design. Personally, I was uh, like trained as a mechanical engineer and then I worked for a few years for L'Oreal as a packaging engineer, making shampoo bottles and cream jars, all of them in plastic and seeing the speed at which uh, machines can like make them. And it's kind of like scary to see all of these products kind of like being filled and sent somewhere and you don't really, well, you know that they're going to end up in the wrong place for sure. Um, so, so after, uh, after that, that's when I decided to kind of like come to study again in, uh, uh, in innovation. Um, and that's when I moved to London and, um, and, and the great thing as well about this masters is that it's very kind of like, uh, self-driven. So, um, it's lots of projects, very collaborative, but basically you choose what you want to work on, what you're passionate about. Um, and so, uh, this project really started out of like, uh, like interest for um for how to make um a packaging for water that would not be an like industrial container but that would be more like a fruit and i think that that was a bit the, the kind of like the the challenge or the the, the question mark and and at that point uh, like um obviously uh like without a background in in seaweed or chemistry or any of these like uh there wasn't like too much um, pre-existing knowledge that we had around this. Um, so uh, we, we, we explored a lot of existing materials that we could get our hands on. We didn't have a lab, so we were doing this in our kitchen. Um, oh, really? And, and so it was very, very low tech. And we started looking at things like uh, bubble tea, uh, the small tapioca seeds that are used for making bubble tea, which is uh, like quite interesting. Uh, we started looking at like cellulose and starches and uh, all sorts of different kind of like food additives that um, had different properties. The cool thing is that all of them were really natural because they were coming from like plants or uh, like natural resources and that they were edible. So that was making things very safe for us to experiment. And actually the fact that we were doing this in the kitchen and not in the lab meant that we could actually like try to eat pretty much anything we would come up with. And so, um, like that's, that's when we, we stumbled upon, uh, like the, the, like this category of like seaweed, uh, products and byproducts that have been used for lots of different weird and wonderful applications. But one of them is, is an, is an extract from brown seaweed that is used for making um, uh, fake caviar. So these little kind of like fish, uh, flavored, uh, like bubbles that, uh, that are really cheap to make, um, that have been kind of like industrialized. I think it's initially a pattern from Unilever from the 1940s. Um, so all of the, uh, like information about it is on in the public domain. So you can just like go and check out the patents and see what kind of like uh, formula they are uh, th they were using back in the day. And so that's kind of how we got started. We ordered some powder from Alibaba and start to kind of like mess around in the kitchen. Um, um, and, and I think that like uh, at that point, it's fair to say that the prototypes that came out of it were uh, like very loose. Um, they were definitely like not resistant and uh, they were like, uh, leaking a lot and they were there was like very very kind of like a uh, few things that were resolved about it but i think that um, we managed to uh, like to really focus on the core kind of like concept of these bubbles that was really exciting um, like hiding a bit the flows for now to kind of like get people uh, get people excited um, and we were ourselves excited. Actually, the name Oho, that's the that's the name that people give it when they see it for the first time. They're like, oh, oh <laughs> that kind of like reaction of surprise. So that was that was really um, like a product that was that needed no intro introduction. People were immediately kind of like seeing that there was something weird going on. Um, and so, uh, like as I said, like it was it was meant to be uh, a relatively small project. But uh, but the video uh, like went viral, and I think that realizing that 
there was actually a lot of interest for this. Uh, that's when we, we started to look at it uh, a bit more kind of like uh, from an entrepreneur angle. Um, how, so how much, luckily there was... How much yeah. effort have you put in the, in, in the initial video? I mean, you know, did you film the video? Did you make it in like one day? I mean, if you made the video yourself and you just posted it online, then it went kind of viral. Or did did you like kind of like secretly saying okay you know maybe there is something like that like behind it let's let's put some effort on the to to make a really nice video and see how it goes. I think so. I think that video uh, like it was definitely not like predicted that it would go viral. But in all the videos that we make, we put quite a lot of efforts in making them exciting. Um, and I think that both Rodrigo and myself. Uh, we've had like experience before of like putting something online and it cr creating quite a lot of traction. So it's a bit playing that that game of like, uh, like presenting something that looks uh, like a bit unbelievable and 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 getting people people's attention. Uh, that video in particular, uh, like that like the first one that went viral, Rodrigo shot it like over uh, like the summer break uh, in his house. I think that like the actors are his sister and his cousin. So it was very homemade, but he was still with a lot of attention to kind of like making the narrative and like making the presentation engaging. And I think that's the, like, that's the thing, like you don't need to have a really high budget video to go viral. Um, and, and, and I think that you also can't control virality. Like there's, there's yeah, been yeah. other times where we've pushed things thinking that like with, with much better videos with like a lot more kind of like pro gear and those didn't take off at all. So it's a, uh, it's part of the timing. Um, and then that video, um, went viral. So we started applying for, uh, like for a, an accelerator called climate kick, which, uh, is supporting, uh, startups that are related with climate change. It's European union, uh, grant money. Um, so this and, is the the first financing you you've you, you've you, you got. Yeah, that so time. that was like I think that was like twenty thousand uh, pounds and like uh, like hot desking in Imperial uh, Incubator and some mentoring and like coaching from uh, business advisors and um, and so we had lined the, this like we were quite surprised to get it in the first place because we didn't really have a business plan or uh, like. The, the 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 track record or the visi like the the credibility of 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 kind of like making this happen, uh, but I think that we had the the passion and uh, we were we were onto something that was exciting, um, and so after lining this up, um, like we uh, we once we graduated, we decided to give it a shot. So uh, we we had this uh, like this little bit of money that uh that we used to uh like to basically get the help from some um chemists and chemical engineers from imperial college to start working on the material try to improve things a little bit um and 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 from there like momentum just continued to increase and we never really kind of like questioned whether or not we should continue or maybe there was like sometimes that were like yeah there were a few like rough patches but i think that we 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 remain convinced ourselves that that was like something really worth pushing for. The rough patches is when other people don't necessarily see that as much as you do as a founder, but <laughs> yeah. What was the hardest part, let's say, you know, in the two first years? Probably the second year was the hardest. <clears throat> the first year was really cool because uh, like the first six months, we just spent kind of like going to conferences where they would uh, invite us to present the project because he had made the headlines on like uh, media and so on. So uh, that was a really great way to kind of like get around, meet some people. We would, uh, we would get like uh, flights and hotels taken care of. So it was, it was uh, like pretty fun six months. No, no work was done on improving the product. And then we realized that that wasn't going to push the project anywhere. So then we kind of like put a bit of like a hard stop on, on just kind of like show and tell and actually kind of like spend the time in developing the, the, the technology. And uh, we also realized that um, our uh, like 
our newness was precious and that we didn't want to kind of like become old news uh, until we have something that we can like really action from, from that news. And like initially, I think it was good to have a bit of awareness, but at some point, if you don't yet have a product that is ready to sell that awareness and like you can use that awareness to maybe raise some funding, but like uh, you need to use the awareness for something that is helpful for the business. Otherwise it's kind of like just uh, wasted. And so we decided to, to be quite kind of like uh, uh, to quite pragmatic about this and like stay under the radar as much as possible so that we would keep uh, a bit of like a uh, variety for when we have, things that line up with the business. Um, and uh, like we we worked on developing, as I said, the material uh, further, um, but also we, we started to kind of like plan for the manufacturing side of things, all that local manufacturing that I mentioned with the machine and developing all of that part, which required a whole different kind of like skill set. But obviously making a machine and like hiring a full team takes uh, quite a lot of money and we, we had we, we had run out of all of that kind of like European Union uh, grant money. Um, and for about nine months, uh, we, we pitched to angels and family offices and like startup pitch events and everything. Always people were like, oh, that's such an interesting concept, but like no one wanted to no be market. the first to, oh, to oh, write yeah. uh, a check. Everyone was like, oh, that's kind of like, uh, yeah, like it would be great if you had that machine to prove that the technology works. And you're like, well, but like we need money to, to build that. <laughs> and and like, especially like funnily enough, like pitching to uh, like at that point, there were there were very few uh, like funds or kind of like seed funds that were focused on uh, like green tech, clean tech and and plastic, it was pre uh, Blue Planet 2 and the whole kind of like ri rise in awareness around like plastic uh, in the oceans as an emotional thing rather than just like a factual thing. So it was much harder to kind of like uh, get uh, like attention. Whereas now plastic, you say plastic and everyone is like, oh yeah, sure, plastic. Um, so I think that that was definitely like a, like a change of heart that happened after uh, that period. Um, and we didn't benefit from that. Um, and, and also like, to be completely fair, we were also like, uh, like early stage in our, in our kind of like business development. We didn't have all the answers that we should probably have had and everything. So no one wanted to fund us. Um, and how did you overcome that? that? Like, uh, so basically that after like we, after we, with, with, uh, with Rodrigo, we gave ourselves a deadline. We said like, if by, uh, like, the 31st of December, we haven't kind of like had either a client signing something or raise some money. Let's just kind of like stop and let's go work for Google and Apple and whatever. And make <laughs> Which year was that? Uh, that was uh, 2016. <laughs> um, and so um, like, I think that we went from pitching to traditional kind of like funds to uh, like having a bit more of like an all-in approach because no one wanted to really kind of like fund this properly. We were like, okay, let's just go for equity crowdfunding. Uh, we don't need to wait for term sheets. We'll just write our own term sheets and put it on the like crowdfunding page, equity crowdfunding page, and like either people are in or out. Um, we control the timing. So it's for 30 days, you're in or you're out. And that really kind of like gave us uh, the opportunity of kind of like controlling a bit the urgency of this. Whereas before it was like, ah, oh, our investment committee meets in three months. Uh, we'll, we'll mention it, but like, and then you're kind of like waiting for three months. And so, um, and I think in like equity crowdfunding is not for everyone, but definitely for us, it was uh, like a really, really great uh like assets. So the equity um, crowdfunding so was this Crowdcube platform? Crowdcube, yeah. That's So basically, um, the difference between normal crowdfunding like Kickstarter and equity crowdfunding is that rather than pre-buying a product on Kickstarter, here you're buying shares in the company, but you can buy shares with as little as £10. So it's very democratic. It's a, like you don't need to be a high net worth or a family office with like people kind of like reviewing deals all the time. If you like an idea, you can put 10, 100, 1,000 pounds 
and your shareholder. Um, and so um, basically, yeah, that, that kind of like uh, felt like something where we could have finally kind of like a last deadline which by the 30th day of that campaign, we haven't raised our funding. That's just kind of like uh, the end and we just kind of like accept the outcome. And it went um, through the roof. And it went through the roof and like it was really unexpected because we, uh, like again, like one thing is you don't control the timing. Um, it's uh, like we couldn't have planned this uh, to happen for sure. It was It was just kind of like very kind of like good timing for us that when we pushed this, um, we, we like the first few kind of like articles that were written about it gave enough kind of like momentum for, for so, some of those videos to go viral. Um, and this time they went really, really viral. I think one of the video on Facebook got 90 million views. Um, so it was just like insane. And basically we went from like what was going to be a long 30 day campaign, emailing every day, questions and answers PR. from like investors to just kind of like sit back and see people kind of like organically finding the campaign and kind of like <laughs> being excited and, and funding us. And so as a result, we got 900 investors from all around the world who really believe in this and are part of the of the story. And that's really, really exciting. How and much equity shares like have you given like uh, in terms of percentage of the company for, for to get that amount of money? So I think it was like about 20% uh, of, of equity. Yeah, for like eight hundred fifty thousand pounds, it's a, uh, it's yeah. It's, so that was like it's, it's it was fair. it was a. That's the the thing about equity crowdfunding campaign. Campaign is that it's very transparent. Uh, you have the terms on the website. You have the valuation. You have all the information, and it's a deal for you or it's not. And it doesn't have to be more complex than this. And I think that that's the that's the great thing is that it gives founders a, a lot more kind of like uh, of an equal kind of like say in in the funding process than than like uh, traditional early stage investors that are typically facing kind of like inexperienced founders that will kind of like take any money because they really want their uh, their startup to kind of like come to to the next stage for the second time you you have a like kind of a viral campaign again uh, this time have you done everything yourself or did you work with some kind of PR agency to launch it or how much have you, how have you prepared that successful crowdfunding campaign? To this day, we haven't spent a pound on external PR or uh, kind of like communication agencies or any of this. We've always done everything in house. Um, as I said, like it's uh, like, it's not a, uh, it's not a given when we put something online, it, doesn't always go viral. Um, I think what we did was make sure that like our content was easy to be taken by all the typical channels that are kind of like sharing this type of news. So it's these little kind of like square videos that you see on Facebook with some like text and so on. Um, so so having like assets that are easy to to be kind of like remashed together with a bit of text in a 60 second video, uh, like essentially just like B-roll. Uh, and not too much kind of like talking heads. That was, I think, like what made it really easy for this to uh, to uh, to be done. And then I think basically what we like what 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 worked uh, particularly very well for us was the adequation of timing between the general kind of like response to the plastic pollution problem and the fact that we had a couple of years of kind of like head start on working on the solution something that was also very differentiating, something that was also kind of like uh, like sounding quite fun and exciting because I think a lot of like the plastic problem and the plastic solutions are about austerity and like reduction. And mm -hmm, kind of like yeah. it's, it's the tone is quite sad, whereas this is a like this is packaging and you can eat it and it's quite kind of like weird and, and different and exciting. And, and you see it like when, when we started doing like events and everything, This is, this is the type of product that like everyone gets their phones out. They start sharing it on whatever kind of like social media. Uh, you do a selfie where you kind of like eat uh, an Oho. Um, all of this um, is, is, uh, is really easy to kind of like, uh, like it, it makes it very easy to, to spread the message. And, 
And who uh, took care of all the like the initial PR and social media strategy when you launched that? Because you had to prepare all these assets, and I think it's a great thing. You have to make it easy. It's a, it's a rule for, for PR. If you want people like in blogs and everything to share it, you have to prepare it like very well. You had, I, I guess, not one chance, but you had your first viral video. So I guess you had a lot of followers already on, on your social media. Facebook was also not... The algorithm was way more friendly for 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 like not paid advertiser uh, reach yeah. at the time, uh, but who prepared all of that in in your in did you, in your team was it you again or did you have someone yeah, actually yeah. So taking it was, care of PR? Yeah, it was it was it was all of us. It was like all done internally. Um, at that stage, we had um, like Liz, um, who is our CFO, who uh, who had joined the team. Um, um, so uh, like. We had uh, like a lot more kind of like uh, skills brought into the the business side of the proposition, and and so that that really like strengthened I think the overall kind of like credibility of what we were doing. Uh, we were starting to grow the team as well with like a few uh, like a few chemists, but like we were we were four five. Uh, we had uh, a few people doing internships, but like it was all done uh, in house. Um, as I said, like we we had. Uh, from like past experience, a few kind of like uh, a few contacts uh, on the media uh, from like from other products that had other projects that had gone viral, where they were like where there had been like a few articles in like newspapers or Wired or Fastco. So we were able to kind of like uh, email a few journalists, but I think overall it was mainly 100% organic. Um, and 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 making sure to post it on the right places on Reddit, on Product Hunt, on the places where it's going to be picked up and kind of like uh, spread. But then like you can do it one day and like nothing happens, and you can do it one one day and like it just blows up and ends up on the front page of the internet. So you you don't control that. So after that, what's a big what's the next big milestone in the, in terms of uh, financing? Yeah. So after that, um, the following summer, uh, we um, we raised a convertible loan from Sky Ocean Ventures. Um, we had started to do uh, like quite a lot of, uh, of activities with Sky, the media group, because uh, they had been one of the media groups that had been pushing the most on the plastics agenda uh, with Sky Ocean Rescue and doing a lot of campaigns uh, to raise awareness. So it was kind of like a natural fit for us to to talk, um, and uh, we uh, like we basically uh, started testing some of our solutions in their canteens and uh, on their campus. And when they started to create a fund for accelerating uh, innovation for uh, tackling plastic in the ocean, uh, it was kind of like a natural kind of like next step to be to become uh, their first investment. Um, and um, we essentially then kind of like had a, like a pretty close relationship with them, which um, when we decided to then fundraise uh, like our last fundraise, which which we did uh, between December and, and, and this April, um, we like we had been working closely with with uh, the, the head of uh, the fund of Scalation Venture that had then moved on to another fund. Um, and so that was kind of like a natural uh, like uh, way to get connected with this fund, which collated the round with another impact fund called Astenor. Um And so uh, we, we found ourselves in, in a much better position this time to raise from traditional VCs. Um, I say traditional, but like with, with a strong focus on impact. Uh, because for us, it was important that we would we would have like as high on the agenda the economic KPIs and the impact KPIs, and I think that we found like a really great uh, group of investors that that bring different uh, added value. All of them quite kind of like unique, but that are all aligned on like making sure that we are growing a, a business that is going to have the maximum impact it can, it can on this problem. How have you proceeded for, for, for to, to make sure to, to select the right investors, especially in the when you reach that that stage of like having to to go to VCs? 
so all the way through, we've always kind of like tried to have conversations early on with, with funds uh, that seem relevant. Um, so for example, um, one of our investors in this round is uh, the Dune Foundation. They are like, it's the money from the, the first call lottery in the Netherlands that gets reinvested in the fund that is focused on social and environmental impact. Um, so um, we actually had done a, uh, like a competition uh, that was organized by uh, by then by them, which we ended up being a finalist. We didn't win, but like I think we were kind of like having a relationship by then. So when it came to kind of like uh, raise, it felt like a like a really good connection to reactivate to say, hey, we are now at this stage. Would it make sense for for us to do something together? And we knew that like they had been funding companies that were inspiring to us, like Fairphone. Um, and that they had like a really rigorous approach to uh, like to impact. So that felt like a really great connection. As I said, uh, like uh, the one of the uh, co-lead for the for the last round, uh, Lupa Systems, the partner was uh, the like the head of the Sky Ocean Ventures Fund pr previously. So that was kind of like a natural connection. And and looking into this new fund that he joined, Lupa Systems. Uh, there was a lot of alignment with uh, like with what we uh, what we're trying to develop as a company. Uh, it's the fund of James Murdoch, who's a board member of Tesla and has like a really big agenda on on sustainability. So it was really great to see that like we were aligned on the core mission of our company and the fund that he had like started. Um, and for Astana, it's the same. It's it's like a really, really strong portfolio with uh, hardware companies that have kind of like a uh, really rich scale, uh, like InFarm that uh, develops this kind of like uh, in-store vertical farming uh, like, uh, like system. Um, and that has really kind of like made those uh, like really successful in, in the market, raised hundreds of millions and, and kind of like show that it's possible to deploy this to insect that has one of the biggest uh, like insect protein factories in the world. So it was really great to, to have like a group of investors that, uh, that have uh, like a wealth of knowledge and, and network that they can help with that have like shown in their previous investments that it's, it's, it's all about like solving some of the biggest problems and having an impact um, and, and things that are kind of like quite uh, actionable for, for us as a company. And I think that, because of because the whole purpose of NotPly is to make packaging disappear, sustainability is not something that we are kind of like spreading on top. Uh, we don't have to retrofit anything. We are built on this mission. So we naturally attract also those conversations with people who are kind of like looking to fund more of this. Um, so, so, so yeah. So, so you basically, like, you are one of the company that actually start with why from your product itself which is yeah. actually a, a very, very strong uh, advantage. Yeah, and I think someone said the other day, like, and I think it's really true that like the best time to fundraise is when you're not fundraising. And so uh, like we are definitely like, although fundraising takes an enormous amount of like attention away from the product and the technology, and it's just kind of like super disruptive in like pushing the business forward it's really good to have like sprints on fundraising when you're close to your kind of like uh, the end of your runway, but it's good to kind of like uh, keep a bit of activity when you're fully funded and that you have like just lots of things to do on the technology side um, so that you seed those kind of like relationships for, for the future. Um, because that's when investors feels like, feel like they, they have the list to offer right now and they are like a little bit more honest. Whereas when they know that you're running out of cash, they feel like they have all the cards in their hands. And yeah, so. they have leverage. Yeah. yeah. This is a very, very good point. Um, there are so many things I would like to, to, to dig into with you, but because uh, I see the time passing by. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'd like to, to, to talk about before we, 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 we start with the usual do's and don'ts, is talking a bit about intellectual property and, and patents. Can you tell me a bit what, I mean, what was your approach regarding patents and like if, if entrepreneurs here are trying to develop some 
you know, really cutting edge product like yours, you need probably like to, 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 to patent your product. What's your experience with that? Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, IP is, uh, like, it's funny because it's, uh, I don't think that there's like a right way to do it. It's so dependent on your business, but I think that for us, what we've kind of like realized is that, uh, there is, uh, like there are some things that you develop that are super easy to see that this is your core IP. Um, and, and those things definitely you should go and like patent them because it's going to be very easy to enforce that if someone makes exactly the same machine or if someone like develops something that you can instantly tell is based on your technology, definitely it makes sense to, uh, to try to use the patent route, but there are a lot of things that are much harder to kind of like enforce and, um, and you can't just kind of like show up in the factory of like a future competitor and, and kind of like expect to be able to check all of their like raw ingredients or whatever it is, or like processes or temperatures or so on. So for these things, patents don't really make sense because all you're doing is kind of like giving them a free tutorial on how to make your stuff. That's going to be published in 12 months. Um, so you're seeing your competition, which like can be a very noble thing to do, but like, I think that, uh, it can be quite hard to, uh, to protect the, the inherent value that you're creating. So in these cases, it's, it's, uh, like it's good to pair some of those kind of like patents of the obvious things with a lot of trade secrets on the less obvious things and the less enforceable things. And so I think that's kind of like the line we've taken for, for things that, uh, are definitely, uh, more in the, like in the details and how to kind of like prove we would, we would never, uh, like take the patent route, especially because patents are also like a huge amount of money. I think over the, the lifetime of a patent, it's going to cost you about 200,000 pounds. So you want to make sure that like, it really is going to bring you significant kind of like money or, uh, like, uh, connections or whatever it is that like is going to make that, that money worth because that's, that's something that could go into R and D or like marketing or whatever else that grows your business. Um, and I think the last thing for us is that we don't think that it's just about technology. So, um, while technology is very important, we also invest a lot in our brand because we think that at the end of the day, uh, like people might still kind of like not take the time to read the spec sheet and know everything about like the technology. They might just trust you because you've developed this kind of like, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this culture and this reputation that you're doing whatever the best you can for sustainability. Um, and I think that's what we aspire to do for packaging that if you're using not packaging, you know, that you're like, you're basically having the least impact you could have with your packaging. Um, and so I think that, yeah, that's, that's like a good way as well to kind of like, uh, like ease a bit the pressure on just the, the technology, but look at it from a more holistic way. So the three things is like obvious, like patenting the, the obvious techno that you have, you have your, your home, you know, made secret, secret recipe that you keep like in your, in your lab and then the branding part for, I know for a lot of the questions that I also got a lot sometimes is like, how do you deal with patenting and, you know, pitching all the time? Because in theory, like if you make something public, uh, it's you can't patent it anymore. So how 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 do you deal with that? What's what's for example? Can you give an example of what you mean? For example, an obvious like an obvious patent and how you approach it with 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 pitching. Yeah, I think I mean all of this is like there is a very fine line between what is made public, what is not made public. The answer is like. Uh, two to 300 pounds an hour lawyer that's going to kind of like argue one way or the other. So it's a very expensive kind of like fine line. So for us, I think, uh, what we found is that, um, uh, like, yeah, it's, it's best not to kind of like shout technical details about what you're creating until you've really have kind of like, uh, made a decision whether or not, uh, you're going to go for the patent route or the trade secrets. Um, and, and usually you don't have to kind of like get into that level of technical details, um, um, publicly. And then, yeah, it really is more like from a enforceable perspective, like, would you go to, uh, like court 
for for this specific element of your technology would that be something that is very easy to win in a in a court or very hard and like i have no idea so i have to rely on like our uh, like ip attorneys to kind of like give us a feel of what is best or not on a specific case but overall the like the rule of thumb is that if it's something that is like like looking completely identical like a piece of machine where like a very simple process where there is like uh there is no way that like they haven't been kind of like copying that that particular uh piece of kit that's something that relates more to a patent whereas if it's something that is going to take uh like a lot of access to the back door of like your competitor to be able to kind of like check whether or not they've been using this piece of like uh technology at certain stage of the process and it's just a sub part of like the overall final product then probably it's worth keeping it as a trade secret then so so for example yeah. in the in the example of like oho it's you you more patenting the the manufacturing equipment than the application itself yeah for example like it's uh, definitely along those lines it's very easy to say mm -hmm. okay like like the machine clearly uh like we we know that like if anyone is going to produce this we can easily like see what machines they are they are using and we've created this new technology so we are we think that it's worth patenting it whereas um if it's one sub process of one of the raw materials that is going to go into the final composition it's going to be impossible to kind of like check that and check that would be worth and uh, finding a pattern that explains to everyone what what you're doing so you always confirm with your uh your, your lawyer first if you can pitch something yeah I, we have a we have a relationship of kind of like using them as a sounding board for kind of like reviewing what we have uh in, in like in our pipeline what would be worth kind of like uh, protecting one way or another um i think to be honest uh one of the big value of like ip for founders i think early stage is to raise funding because a lot of investors traditionally like to see patents um i think that like it's not justified i don't think that like businesses that have like uh patents for the sake of having patents are like going to be so much more successful than others that are basing everything on trade secrets i think that like it's a uh, it's it's a bit old school um but nonetheless if it helps you raise some funding i think that like that's a that's a good mm -hmm. way to go about it i think if uh, if your business model revolves around licensing uh your technology you don't want to produce anything you don't want to kind of like get your hands uh like dirty then probably you really need to kind of like get a strong uh like position but equally i think that like things have moved on from like uh the time that it was all revolving around a patent i think there's a lot of like things that are done in a in a very innovative way that don't need necessarily patents to uh like to get other partners to do parts of the process for you um so so yeah i think like it's just like given how expensive it is i would really question whether that's the best you can do with with that money at that point um especially because if you're in a like uh if you're in a new field you're also going to always kind of like keep on pushing on r d there's always going to be new things so there's also like this question of like when is the right timing to file something should you wait another year and then you're going to have like something even better or should you do it earlier and kind of like make sure that uh, you've kind of like make your your territory kind of like very clear and there is no right or wrong answers about this they are down to yeah to your tech to your appetite for paying for like patents and uh so yeah <laughs> and the budget you have for it but yeah and the budget uh, like, you have, if you have obvi obviously like so like rely on law or your on your attorneys and uh it's also a very good point that if you're not licensing when you are actually one of the first in the market also developing something you already have a step ahead of a lot of people and uh and th that secret recipe is something you, you you're going to keep and you can keep on moving forward quicker than others yeah. um Let's move to the do's and don'ts. So today uh, you give us some ad advice on you know, disruptive innovation, how to create a packaging that disappear, which was a pretty obvious title. 
given uh, given, given our like your company today. Um, so you you've sent me a list of like four do's and three don'ts that I'm really looking forward to discuss with you. So the first one is uh, trust your expertise. Yeah. So I think um, it's something that um, can seem um, like a bit weird, but you're gonna you're gonna be spending five, six, seven years, ten years on the particular subject that you're working on when you start a, a startup. So no matter what, you're going to become an expert of that field. But like when you start at first, you can feel a bit as an outsider in an industry where you don't know everything about. Certainly at the beginning, we knew nothing about seaweed. Um, and the more we go and the more we realize how much there is to know about seaweed that we still don't know. But I think that like uh, it doesn't stop us from uh, like from really engaging on like uh, like on par with the in like the scientists and the the industry uh, on on seaweed and like now I mean I still find it weird that like we're invited to speak at seaweed conferences I've never studied seaweed but I've been working with with seaweed for the past six years so so really trust that like you're gonna pick up all of those kind of like little kind of like details and know how and everything from the industry that you're in. And give yourself like uh, like the credit and the like the confidence in in yeah, calling you an expert of that, and you'll you'll be continuously improving. The second one is pitch all the time. Yeah, so I think that's pretty obvious for 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 probably a lot of founders, but I think that like there is no kind of like uh, like there is no way to know who is going to open a door for you and there's times where you're like, ah, oh, but like, uh, probably I'm like, uh, at a random dinner or I'm at like a conference that has nothing to do with what I do. Is it worth kind of like always kind of like keep on presenting my project? And, and, and I think that like in hindsight, we've had, uh, people kind of like getting in touch three, four years after we've kind of like they first met us at some event and they're like, Oh yeah, I remember like when you said this and like, I've sent your way, this guy and this guy, or I've kind of like connected you with this. or I think I could make this introduction or open this door for you. So I think, um, it, it's a, it's a good reminder that it's, uh, yeah, because it's impossible to know what doors it's going to open for you. It's worth always kind of like pushing as much as you can on, uh, and, and it, it helps to practice as well because, uh, you never know when you're going to have one minute with a uh, with an investor. Uh, I think Rodrigo found himself on a ski lift uh, in uh, Davos with the <laughs> CEO of uh, Coke, uh, and so he had like he was better than the elevator pitch. He was the the ski lift pitch, and yeah, like after like years of pitching, it comes natural. And so that's a great yeah. story. <laughs> did, it, did it end up like a? Like in a partnership or in a future partnership yet? Not yet. <laughs> um, the third do is consider innovative funding. So you 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 briefly yeah. you already talked a bit about that. Do you, do you do you want to add something about this? It's kind of uncanny how we focus all our efforts in being super innovative and disruptive on the product, but we follow the same business models or the same funding. I think investment is very, very old school and traditional in the way that it works. So it doesn't make sense to just be innovative on your product, but do everything the same. So I think that for us, we were lucky that there was like this emerging equity crowdfunding. There will be some other ways that are kind of like going to pop up. And I think it's totally worth to engage with those. And it was very successful for you. So that's great. Um, the four do is... Uh, recharge your batteries and take care of yourself. I guess that's a very, very important advice for a lot of entrepreneurs out there. Yeah. So I think, I think, uh, this one is, uh, it's going to be a long journey and, and there's going to be moments of kind of like pure kind of like, uh, like joy and excitement and accomplishment, but there's also going to be like some moments where it feels like things are a bit stuck and, People are not really getting it, and I think that it can be quite draining. And so uh, it's it's like you need to to make sure that uh, that you keep your level of energy as as high as you can. And I think that 
personally for me, uh, I know that I have like, uh, like hobbies on the side and like things that I do that I know are going to disconnect my brain from, from that platform for some time. And that's really, really important to, uh, to keep that kind of like continuous energy to, to push because, uh, yeah, like when, when you lose the, the energy to push, that's like, uh, like that has the most significant impact on your startup. If you're the founder, you need to, you need to really kind of like, uh, take care of, of that potential that you have to always, uh, push and you need to know how, what buttons to hit to recharge the battery of yourself. And, uh, it's very important indeed. And what do you do to make sure you stick to these like activities? Is it something that, for example, you, you, you block in your, in your calendar that every week you play tennis or you go golfing or I don't know what you do and whatever the deadline you have, you stick to that? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I might not be as kind of like methodical at this, um, but like I do things that I really, really enjoy on the side. And so I know that like I have a natural motivation to, to do them. And that's what keeps me from like, uh, kind of like skipping it for, for too long. Uh, but yeah, I think whatever like mechanism you can find for yourself to, to make sure that you, uh, you don't just do the startup, uh, seven days a week, uh, like is, is a, is a good move. Um, and, and I think that there is times where it needs to be seven days a week and when you need to kind of like push, but you can't sustain that for, for 10 years. So you have to also kind of like know how to find the balance of the moments where it's kind of like all in and the moments where it needs to be a bit more kind of like, uh, comfortable and, and when you need to recharge the, those batteries. What's your trick to find that balance? Because it's something, what you're saying is like kind of something that I know I hear a lot, but how, what's your internal like trigger or, uh, to, to make sure like, that, Oh, actually now I need to, I know I need to, to take care of myself. And yeah, I think personally, I, uh, like I, uh, I love to create, uh, things. I think that like in the early years of the startup, uh, there was a lot of like hands-on, uh, activities. Uh, I prototyped the first machine and like, as I was saying, like we were making everything in our kitchen. So we were spending like not too much time on the computer and more time just kind of like making prototypes. And so that was, I think that that's, that's my, uh, like that's, that's one part of what, uh, drives me. Um, so knowing that I, I'm, I'm, yeah, like a maker and I like to have, uh, like tangible things that I've, that I'm making with, uh, with my hands, that's what that drive is, is what I try to kind of like channel through, uh, like, uh, artistic hobbies and, and, and things that I create on the side. Um, so I think that's something that I, that I've learned about myself and I can use that frustration, that, that creative frustration to know that like, it's time to do something else, uh, this weekend or like this evening. Um, so, so it's, it's about like knowing how to listen to, to yourself and, and, and when the frustration go high, it's, uh, it's, it's like a good cue that like it's time to, uh, to spend a bit more time on, on the other stuff. That's okay. That's a great, that, that's what I, I wanted to, to find out with you because, uh, frustration in that, in that case is your cue. Uh, in yeah. my case, I know that when I'm start, when I start to be in a bad mood, I know that's, that's when I need to stop. And usually it's because I, you know, I have deadlines and I end up like working until one in the morning, three days a week. And that's usually like when, when my baby starts to actually not sleep that well, <laughs> it's always like that. Uh, and uh, even though I have a deadline, I know I have to stop and to start doing more sport or do more music. And, uh, but it's, yeah. it's on my side, it's, it's bad mood, your side's frustration. So it's important that everyone finds his own, uh, like cue. And yeah, thank you for that. So let's, Talk about the don'ts now. Uh, you said don't push more of the same. Yeah, I think I mean that's that's uh, specific to uh, sustainable packaging, but I think that like um, there is a lot of existing biopolymers, um, for example PLA, that are frankly quite a lot of greenwashing. They don't solve. They, they create more problems than they solve. Um, and they are, they are definitely not kind of like 
delivering on their promise. Um, and I think that what's unfortunate is to see more and more brands that are just kind of like taking those materials as is and, and just creating a new proposition for one specific niche. Um, we don't need more PLA. We don't need more kind of like traditional plastic uh, branded well and made startup-y. Uh, we need true innovation that like delivers something that is going to be significantly better than like the current status quo. Um, so I would say that, yeah, it's, uh, uh, if, if you're interested in that space, uh, don't go for another kind of like food brand with a PLA wrapper or a PLA bottle or, uh, like, uh, recycled plastic, something or something, because there's already plenty of them and we are just kind of like digging the same hole. Um, so we need, we need a, a, a bit more radical change. Do you have any like tip for, uh, for people who wanted, would like to start looking at something new, for example, is there some kind of new, not a trend, but it's some kind of really innovative material like seaweed that are not explored enough right now and would be worse to be digged into? I think there's so many materials. I think, Uh, that's one of the things that excites us is uh, we already have all of those building blocks around us um, from uh, mushrooms to uh, like shrimp shells that can make chitosan. Um, there's lots of people doing really interesting things with uh, like agriculture, uh, waste fibers. There's, there's just a lot of natural materials that have plenty of potential. Um, that definitely aren't as studied as much as uh, as uh, like plastic has been. So we are not at full potential of what can be done with them. Um, and each application has its own needs. Like there's not two fruits that are the same in nature because they adapt to the environment. And right now the problem of plastic is that we have the same format wherever you consume, wherever you kind of like buy in the world. Um, so there needs to be a little bit more granularity. And I think the other exciting thing is that um, like, it's not about uh, like only changing the packaging, but I think that if we want more sustainable products, there's a lot we can do about changing the content to make it work with more sustainable packaging because we've just created a luxury of having plastic that can contain anything for any length of time uh, and uh, like is very easy and cheap to produce. So we've been very complacent on making content more sustainable but i think it's really exciting to see what's happening with uh like waterless cosmetics of like actually saying we transport so much water let's just make things more concentrate you can mix it at home uh, in a bottle with your own tap water um making things uh with uh like with with uh, specific raw materials that are more shelf stable on their own so that you don't need the plastic to make the product great you can have something that is a little bit more kind of like resistant to the environment. And I think all of these things, they have the potential of like unlocking a lot more of those materials that are not so used right now, because when you're a buyer from uh, one of those big FMCG company, you want to see a spec sheet that compares to plastic. And obviously all the parameters that you're looking at, like natural materials are not matching plastic and you're just kind of like teaching it for that reason. Whereas we don't need to match plastic. Uh, there's there's lots of ways that we can use the, the the packaging technologies that are available with smart uh, content that matches those those uh, those materials so that we can have an altogether better proposition than 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 just kind of like uh, plastic. So there is a need for a better matching between content and packaging. Yeah. Throwing up the ideas for people who want to start a company right now. Yeah. Um, the last don't was, no, sorry, there are two more. Uh, don't greenwash and don't dilute the trust in your industry. Yeah. And I think that's one that like we are just realizing, uh, more recently, but if you're going to change significantly, significantly the impact of, a like of a whole industry, it's not going to just be you, your company that's going to do that. You're going to need competitors. You're going to need other stakeholders and everyone is going to kind of like be a play an integral part in the success of the industry. You, you, you can't do this in vacuum. So realizing this, um, like it's actually very important that no one is kind of like, uh, 
communicating or taking actions that are going to discredit the whole industry. I mean, for example, for us, there is the seaweed industry. Um, we think that seaweed has, is going to have a great potential for packaging. But if some other startups that are either farming seaweed or using it for other types of packaging or whatever it is, are, are damaging the, like, the reputation of that whole industry, we're all going to suffer from that. And I think that like, it's just uh, like a call for being responsible about the success of an, uh, uh, an overall industry. And if you're driven by purpose and by kind of like impact, you should already pretty be pretty kind of like conscious about these things. But yeah, it's not like, a, like if you're jumping on, on like a, a, a purpose venture, uh, you're not going to try be the, the, to become the next Amazon or the next Facebook. You're going to have to work a lot more collaboratively with the rest of your industry and, and, and be conscious that any kind of like greenwashing you do is going to deserve everyone else um, and, and, and you'll, you'll lose all the, the, the benefits from that collaboration with the industry yourself. Very good point. And I, we hear that way more, like more and more often, and that greenwashing is going to be one of the, of the key thing to avoid in the, in the coming years. Um, the last don't was don't think you can control everything. And that's, yeah, that makes me think, think about the, <laughs> that makes me think about the, uh, have you read the uh, Andre Agassi's biography? No. That's a very, very good uh, biography to read. I think the, the first chapter is one of the... I, I, I listened to it as an audiobook, actually. And the first yeah. chapter for me was one of the best like chapter I've listened to in my life, I think. Uh, it's, it's really like the narrative is, is fantastic. Okay. Uh, but he actually says, control what you can control or worry yeah. about only what you can control. So I'm really curious what you have to say about don't think you can control everything. Yeah. I think basically it's just kind of like lifting a bit of weight off the shoulders of like founders. It's not just going to be about like pure hard work. There's going to be moments where the timing is right and it's going to be easier. And there's going to be moments where the timing is terrible and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and I think that like certainly for us, uh, we've had like a few moments where it seems that, uh, like we, we get like, a uh, uh, a really helpful kind of like uh, combination of events that make something happen really, really easily. And, and we totally kind of like appreciate the fact that it was not down to us um, or our hard work. It was down to circumstances. Um, so we've got to be, yeah, like uh, humbled by that and, and realizing that um, we can, all we can do is like prepare our luck uh, as much as we can. But, uh, but, but, uh, yeah, don't beat yourself up when things don't happen. Um, if you launch your crowdfunding campaign, the, the week that Donald Trump dies or whatever it is, you're, you're not going to kind of like get your fair share of media <laughs> and, uh, it's just the way it is. So I think that no, that's, that's just a, a good reminder that it's not, it's not just you. And so crowdfunding campaign is a very, very good point as well. Like, uh, like it's, it's, yeah. you're so much depending on what's, what's, uh, what's going around. Uh, I, yeah. wait, you launched the company in 2014. Do you, I, I guess you, do you, have you heard about the, the cooler cooler? Yeah. That was actually a, a really good example at the time because <laughs> I was launching my startup as well at the time, uh, like feels a beat and the cooler cooler was this fantastic, super cool cooler to cool your, your, your food uh, when you go for a picnic. And uh, I remember they launched the campaign in January one year and they failed completely. And then they didn't give up. They relaunched it, like treated a little bit, relaunched it in summer and it, they, they went, they, they went yeah. through the roof. So that's also something like uh, that's timing <laughs> is, is obviously, obviously crucial. Um, thank you very much for all these advice. Let's, Finish with the last questions, uh, the usual one from, uh, ones from my guests. What's the best advice you've been given as an entrepreneur? Um, you should work with people that you like to work with. Um, and I think it's really like uh, key when you're like uh, building the team, uh, uh, like make sure that you're, you're not just kind of like looking for skill sets, but you're looking with for people that you want to spend 
sometime working out some pretty hard problems together. It's a very good one. Um, which error have, have you made in the past that you wouldn't commit again if you had to start over the company now? It's hard to say because I think you always kind of like learn something from these things. Um, I think I remember like at the time of the crowdfunding, realizing that like we had like struck a chord with uh, the general public. It felt like we should have done that like nine months earlier when we were just starting to fundraise. Uh, but equally, I think that like it made us appreciate the 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 hard reality of fundraising as well. So, but yeah, like I would have I would have definitely like maybe accelerated that plan rather than treating it as a backup. Very good. Uh... What's your favorite question to ask candidates during your recruiting process? You're talking about hiring the right people. So what's your favorite question? Um, we have this question with, uh, with Rodrigo. I think both of us are definitely uh, like pretty good starters. That's where we kind of like get the most excited. And we tend to be uh, like uh, less passionate about like the final implementation stages of like Of, of, a, of a particular project. Um, so, so we, and, and, and we realize that we need both starters and finishers. So we try to balance the team. So often we, we like, oh, pretty much every time we'll ask where people think they are like on, on the spectrum of starter to finisher. Um, and, uh, and like embracing like both kind of like uh, both types of people and making sure that in a given team, there's a good balance of like starters and finishers. So in that case, you're looking for people who have a, a, a passion for details and who can go into the, the, the last detail, details of every project. Yeah. And like, um, we're also looking for starters for other projects, but like, it's just that like overall, uh, it's, uh, it's good to, to have people who are going to, like, it's just like what drives people. Some people really, really love that kind of like first moment, first brainstorming where you feel like you could just make this thing kind of like go big and like have a lot of impact and so on. And some people are finding this kind of like, uh, like, uh, much less kind of like real than the actual impact you have when you press on the button and like everything starts to work and you actually kind of like deliver on like, a on, on a project. So I think it's, it's good to have, uh, the input from everyone. Good. Um, what, uh, which book would you recommend entrepreneurs uh, to read? Um, well, I've just been recommended one recently, uh, teams of teams, uh, written by this, uh, like army general about like how they had completely re reorganized themselves, uh, during, uh, the, like, Afghanistan wars because they were the best army in the world, super trained, and they were losing against people that were very loosely kind of like organized. And, uh, and I think, uh, like what I'm interested to, to learn from it is like the, the book is not about war. It's about like how to pass on those learnings to, uh, other types of organizations like businesses. But I think it's quite interesting to, yeah, to find ways to, uh, like, Uh, to create uh, that that feeling that like teams can be very agile and make kind of like uh, calls themselves and be aware of like the impact they have on others without having uh, a traditional hierarchical uh, system. I think that, that um, one of the things we we try as much as possible is to uh, to have um, everyone feeling like they can make an input at any level of like the decision making in that part. And, um, and, and obviously as you grow, it's one of the questions, like, how do you, like, how do you grow the structure? And, and I think that, that, uh, concept of teams of teams, rather than like a pyramid is something that is really attractive to us, but teams I've just started of, it. So team of teams, yeah. New rules yeah. of engagement for a complex world. I will yeah. put the link in the resources of the episode online. So thank you very much. What's a training podcast blog? Uh, or influencers you'd recommend to to follow i don't follow too many to be honest um 
I uh, I've restarted uh, recently started reading uh, Courier magazine, which I find quite interesting. Uh, there's there's like a lot of really nice uh, like in-depth articles about like different topics that uh, are somewhat related with startups and often sustainability, but not only. It's a so London London-based magazine. Courier. Courier, courier, so, yeah. courier media.co. Okay. And uh, the the funny part is, tell us one thing about you that I wouldn't be able to find out online. Well, I mean, you might be able to find that online, but like one of the interesting things that like I've been uh, trying to do during the lockdown is uh, like... As I mentioned, I I, I do uh, like quite a lot of uh, generative art on the side, which is my kind of like creative hobby, creating uh, like uh, like artwork that is designed by an algorithm or like a piece of software, so that it's kind of like a combination of human input and machine input. And I started a uh, an Instagram account uh, that is dedicated to this kind of like community, which is quite niche, but like that has kind of like grown in popularity over the past uh, few months. That's called Generative Hut. And uh, and so during the lockdown, uh, I started like having this idea of like, like it would be great to, to make a book um, that is like showcasing all the art work from uh, the, the community. Um, so, uh, Currently, there is like uh, like uh, a project going on of like developing that book that hopefully will become available in in a few months, um, and that should be a quite interesting, uh, very different kind of like project than than Notpla, uh, and I'm doing that in collaboration with uh, uh, with uh, Vetro Edition, which is a Berlin uh, small publishing house. Uh, um, so hopefully that's going to be an, an exciting project and that, uh, it's, it's definitely not, uh, like on the internet for now it's, uh, in preparation. Yeah. I'm looking forward for the book, but, uh, people can, so I will share also the link, uh, on, on, on the, the webpage, but you already have like 65,000 followers on Instagram and the, the graphics are visuals are uh, fantastic. So yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, the last question I had is like. During the interview, it occurred to me, when was the first time you were, you got drunk with, uh, with your edible like, uh, capsules? Because I, I know you can put alcohol in it. So I was wondering if that happened. Yeah, I think, um, well, definitely last Christmas party when we had just closed our round of funding and uh, we were doing a, a project with uh, the Glenlivet uh, whiskey brand uh, where we were doing like edible, uh, like, uh, whiskey cocktails in our, in our bubbles. Um, we had a little bit of like extra, uh, like stock from like the previous production that we had kept on the side for the Christmas <laughs> party. So that was definitely a good one. Um, so yeah, they can be deadly if you, if you don't watch out for, for yeah. how many you're having. <laughs> it's like an edible shot. It's perfect. So that's exactly, another market. Yeah. It's perfect. So thank you very much for, for your time and for all these um, advice, uh, Pierre. Um, this is just your time now to share whatever you want uh, with our listeners. So, you know, is there one thing you want to, to share? Where can they find you, uh, your company? Are you hiring? Are you looking for funding for investors? Uh, it's your time now if you want to share that. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, so I think um, like one of the things we're quite excited to do uh, now is to uh, is to work with um, direct to consumer brands, especially on the waterless cosmetics or on the instant drinks like instant coffee, uh, like hot chocolate, uh, instant tea. We have uh, developed uh, like uh, a solution that is uh, that can be soluble in water, uh, so you could make really different kind of sachets that completely disappear um, either in like uh, like in, in a hot water mug or in your pot or there's all sorts of like different things that can be done with seaweed that you can't really do with plastic. Um, so, um, we are, uh, 
we're really open for like collaborations with um, waterless cosmetic brands or kind of like uh, dry food uh, like brands, especially because we've realized that for direct to consumer, people end up receiving a lot more packaging than if they were buying things in the store because that's kind of like removed before they see it on the store. So it's all the more important to have uh, like sustainable packaging if you want to maintain that kind of like uh, adequation of values with with your with your consumers. So if you have a waterless uh, cosmetic brand or uh, like uh, a similar kind of brand that could benefit from our uh, like flexible uh, film, uh, please do get in touch. Um, and um, we're always hiring, so have a look on our website. Uh, there is a page. Usually, like we post all of our uh, jobs on Indeed, but you can find them on the website as well. Uh, make sure to follow uh, us on uh, Instagram and, and Facebook and LinkedIn. That's where we post the the most relevant updates about the, the business. Um, and at the moment, um, you can only try our products in the UK because uh, it's just easier for us to kind of like start with the local market. So uh, we we appreciate that everyone is really kind of like excited to, to come and test uh, one of those whiskey shots or like a ketchup sachet or one of our boxes. I think that we're getting closer and closer to, to that. But um, at the moment, unfortunately, we're only uh, available in the UK. Um, so maybe post-COVID pay us a visit in, in London and and uh, you can come and try the, the products. Um, and yeah, if uh, like through COVID, there's also been like a rise of uh, like people starting seaweed farms. Um, so if you if you're thinking of like working in the in the seaweed kind of like value chain, do get in touch. Uh, would love to kind of like work with the people who have the best sustainability credentials in the industry. Um, so so yeah, I think that's the the message. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, I wish you all the best and uh, keep on like making packaging that disappear. And uh, thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful journey with your company. Thank you very much. <laughs> If you like this podcast, there are two things you can do that would mean the world to me. The first thing is to sign up for the podcast newsletter. That way you will be notified of the new episodes but you will also get a summary of the learnings at the end of every season. Plus, for each episode, you will get the resources and the list of do's and don'ts that every guest shares with me. And finally, you will also get the opportunity to ask our future guests one question in advance. You can sign up for this newsletter on gtimpact.com. The second thing you can do to be super helpful is to recommend this podcast. For that, you can write a review on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with your friends, other entrepreneurs, and people trying to build a sustainable future. That way, we can all learn together and work on a brighter future for us, our children, and our planet. Thank you very much, and see you next week for the next episode. Have a nice day!